OK, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the TTRA European Chapters webinar, uh, Post COVID Travel Insights on Europe. Um, we have had a number of technical issues already today before we even started, so please bear with us as we move through the, the this afternoon's presentations. Just some housekeeping in terms of any of you that are on live uh, with us right now. If you have questions for the panelists, uh, you can ask questions through the chat function, but please name the panelists you would, you're addressing your question to. It would just make it easier, or if you'd like all of them to answer it, just put down all at the start of it. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our panelists. There's two of our panelists that haven't succeeded in logging into us yet. So if they arrive, great. And if they don't, we will just have to proceed. This is the, the world of technology we're currently operating in right now. So our panelists are Dr. Edouard Santander, who is Chief Exe Executive Director and uh, Chief Executive of the European Travel Commission. We have Professor Dimitrios Buhalas, who is at Bournemouth University, a very accomplished and uh, well published, uh, published author in the whole sphere of hospitality and tourism. We have Ms. Sarah Dignan, who is Director of Client Relationships with STR based in London. And last but not least, we will hopefully have Peter Nash from Ireland here, who has just retired from our DMO, Tourism Ireland, where he was a uh, general uh, manager for Europe and uh, Central Europe, Northern Europe and Central Europe. So uh, the way the format is going to work, we're going to have our panelists do a short presentation first to sort of lay out their stall in terms of how they see the current crisis and pandemic has impacted on travel and tourism in Europe. And then we're going to open it up to a sort of a Q&A or a round table scenario um, where they'll have a general discussion and uh, an opportunity for you that are attending today to ask questions. So we'll start off with Demetrius first, slightly different in terms of running order because we're tr still trying to get uh, Eduardo to, to log in. Um, so uh, over to you, Demetrius. Tyson, uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to contribute today. Uh, and, and I think everybody's trying to understand how we can operate in this new environment that we found ourselves uh, in there. Um, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to share some of my uh, thoughts. And as you know, I've been following COVID uh, since uh, early February, um, and, uh, and I've seen what's happening in different markets. Uh, I think we, we kind of uh, named the webinar as post-COVID, and I think that is misleading. We are still in very much in the middle of COVID, uh, and it's going to take a while until we get to the post-COVID era. I think um, the post-COVID era will come when we've got a successful vaccine that we will know that uh, it will be very effective and will, it will bring us to the next stage. Uh, until then, we will have to operate in, within the COVID environment and, and understand the parameters of, 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 of our operations. I think COVID uh, managed to get tourism to ground zero. Uh, the tourism and travel is a very resilient industry and we've had to deal with a lot of disasters and a lot of different crises in the past but we've never had a situation where we got into the ground zero. Uh, when we had September 11, we had um, uh, flight stops for a period of time and a lot of people were very nervous of traveling, but then within a week everything was traveling. So um, really when you say crisis and when you see uh, when you see disasters in tourism, what normally happens is that it takes a few days or a few hours. So September 11 took about four hours for mm. disaster happen and then we go to recovery. When you have got the tsunami, it only takes a few minutes and then you're going to recover. It leaves a, a huge range of issues behind, but we know that when the event finishes and when we go to recovery. The problem with COVID is that we've been in this for many, many months now, five, six months, seven months, and we're still, uh, it's still going. It's moving from geographically, but still going. Uh, so we don't know, we are on ground zero and a prolonged time zero, uh, ground zero position and we don't know when we'll be able to, to move again and, and travel again uh, as much as we would like to. We've seen a lot of different countries and a lot of different companies uh, trying to um, uh, restart tourism and there's some, some evidence of this happening but, but nowhere near the level that we had in 2009. I think we need to start understanding the markets and the key segments and who are the people who are traveling, who are people who are not traveling. Uh, you may have heard me before that I've segmented the market into four different categories. 
The first category is people who are shielding, uh, people that they've got uh, health issues or, or they're older and they're staying away from, from everything uh, and they try to protect themselves. Then we've got a situation where a lot of people became unemployed or much poorer and this is what I call the the poor market, uh, people who, are, who cannot afford to travel anymore. Then you've got the segment that I call smart. These are the people who are looking to all the epidemiological uh, information. They're trying to decide when to book and where to go and how to go. And then you've got the, the last group that is uh, what I call kamikaze, is that people who are traveling no matter what, they kind of probably don't believe that COVID exists or they don't believe that they, it's going to affect them and they don't take precautions. Those people are those who are going to uh, create a lot of problems in the marketplace. I talked about resilience and recovery. Our industry is very resilient and, and will recover very, very soon once we've got the vaccine. In the meanwhile, we need to understand how we can operate with the health protocols and how we can operate facilities, uh, hotels and uh, transportation and attractions with the protocols being in place. So all, all the information, all the advice that we get from the World Health Organization about masks, about um, uh, personal hygiene, about distances and all of those things that we need to bring to the place. I think it's critical that uh, what we found is that the tourism industry has demonstrated solidarity and, and humanity. It has provided a lot of facilities uh, for people who are on the first, on the front line and there are people who were fighting in, in the health front. A lot of um, restaurants, a lot of hotels uh, provided accommodation, they provided meals for health workers and key workers. And um, some of the car companies provided cars for, for um, people to, to move around uh, different materials and, and facilitate what's happening. I think what we, we find is that Solidarity in humanity is really required at this stage of, of COVID, of this, uh, 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 of, of this disaster that we're going through, in order to make sure that, that humanity and our societies and our communities are going forward. Now, uh, when you're looking to destination management and marketing, I've been saying that you need smart and tourism, smart tourism and agile solutions. To understand what's happening, what are the epidemiological uh, data and how we can operate, whether where we can uh, develop bridges and we can bring people to safe destinations and how we can operate. Uh, there's a lot of technological solutions that are coming out uh, and many of those are based on disinfecting areas, many of those are on crack and trace, there are many of them, many technological solutions like mobile applications that enable contactless contactless um, uh, travel. So all in all, uh, because you asked me to talk about five minutes, it's really about COVID is here, it's a reality. Until we've got the vaccine, we're going to have a, an issue um, addressing all the requirements and being able um, to travel safely. In the meanwhile, we really need to build our resilience, understand what we can do in different markets and different segments, to develop our solidarity and our humanity and observe the, the health uh, protocols and learn how to operate destinations uh, by using technological uh, solutions that will uh, enable us um, to operate safely uh, for both our communities and our travelers. I think that will be the, the opening statement. Thank you. Sean, do you want to introduce Sarah? Sean, I think you, we cannot hear you. You haven't, your microphone is muted. Uh, technology, as you will find, is not my strong point. Um, I don't know if you can hear me now. But uh, I want to introduce Sarah. So thank you very much, Demetrius. First of all, for your presentation it was excellent. A great overview as to where we currently are in relation to the virus and travel and its impacts. Um, Sarah is going to delve a little deeper now in terms of the stats behind all of what you've just said, and in particularly focusing on hotel occupancy and 
uh, uh, we've all seen in the media, you know, uh, occupancy both on airlines and in, in hotels and right across travel and tourism in general fell off a cliff in March as a result of the, the crisis. And uh, I think our presentation is going to show us in stark terms how that played out. So over to you, Sarah. Perfect. Thank you, Sean, and thanks for the um, invitation. And I'm not tech savvy either, just to make you feel slightly better. So let's see how this goes. Um, and I don't know if I've control to move along or if someone can move my slides along, you that should. would be awesome. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. So just to set the scene, guys, I'm going to just jump jump backwards and forwards a little bit and we're going to look at hotel room closures. And Demetrius, I'm going to steal one of your um, comments just there around ground zero, because it certainly was a situation of ground zero. So if we go back uh, a number of years now and look at where we were in terms of hotel closures, pretty much everything that was available to open in the market was open. Um, and right now we're sitting at about 10%. So come the end of September, we're expecting that to drop below 10%. So essentially 90% of all rooms in any marketplace around the world will have reopened in some shape or form. We are starting to hear a little bit of hotels and, and hotel rooms that are going to remain closed into next year, uh, some as, as far out into Q2 of next year, but that's certainly the exception and not the rule. And if we move on to the next slide and just look in a little bit more detail at that and what various different um, countries around the world look like. And a um, little bit of animation on here then as well. What you're seeing in that blue box is kind of what we're forecasting through the end of this year and even the first couple of days of 2021. China is pretty much there thereabouts, almost fully reopened, as is the US. China is obviously in a very different place in the cycle than the vast majority of the rest of us in, uh, at least in Europe and in the Middle East, so all in slightly different uh, places in the cycle. Germany and the UK, we're sitting at about 10% of all rooms that are still closed. France and Italy is a bit higher, uh, heading between kind of 10 to 15%. And then Spain, where we've seen a lot of rooms reopen, and then we've actually started to see some closures again so as cases start to increase, and that second wave, which I'll touch on in just a second. So if we look at some of the data then, two different sets of data going on here. So let me explain what both of them are. First of all, reporting occupancy is what we define as rooms that are rooms and hotels that are open and operating. This is for a one week's time series. So it's from um, August 16th through to August 23rd. So right up until Sunday of, I was gonna say last week, but the previous week. So Sunday, so a little bit over a week ago, about nine days ago. That, and they're the larger blue bubbles. The lighter of the blue um, bubbles, lighter colour of the blue bubbles, should I call them, um, they are what we call economic occupancy. And this is where we put back in all of those rooms that would ordinarily be open that are still closed. And it essentially, as you can see, dilutes that occupancy, but does give kind of a, a real understanding of what the demand is in any given market. Most of us, I think it's fair to say, would be quite happy if we were sitting over there in mainland China. And you'll see the two numbers are pretty much the exact same or are the exact same as a, a small um, point difference, um, less than one percentage point difference in the two. And that is really a clear signifier that all rooms um, have reopened in mainland China. Roll over to Europe. There's a little bit of a more of a disparate. If you just go back to the last slide for one second, Andrew, sorry. Um, in Europe, then uh, next one a little bit more disparate. So we're seeing 45% based on hotel rooms that are open and operating and 36% on those on that economic reporting number. Now, again, some of that is where we've seen some hotels start to reclose again, uh, either because cases have started to increase depending on where you are in Europe, or indeed with the unfortunate circumstance where hotels have opened, hoping to generate um, demand, and then that demand just doesn't exist. And it just doesn't make sense to stay open, at least in the short to medium term. If we move on then, and if we look at kind of what the factor was, look at this again, the reporting methodology. So the open and operating hotels, you'll see it's a mixed bag. This map for any of you that have sat on, in on some of the uh, Europe or the Middle East and Africa or the Asia Pacific uh, webinars we've been doing throughout COVID, you'll have seen this map has uh, has changes, co changed colour quite frequently as the days and weeks go, go by. So again, a seven day period up to the 22nd of August. So North America, we're seeing lots of green, so many markets sitting at that kind of 50 to 75 percent occupancy. Uh, of course, Labor Day weekend coming up this coming weekend, so we expect to see even uh, darker buckets of green for some locations. Um, a little bit more on the orange side, you get into kind of continental Europe, certainly down in Spain, 
uh, Portugal, so you were seeing uh, Italy also, where you were seeing that come kind of more 25 to 50 percent. That is based on open and operating hotels. And then a mixed bag as you head into Asia as well. But again, um, as per the previous slide, China doing pretty well. If we move on then. And if we look then at, so look at looking at the open and operating hotels, what's the difference? So if we look at China, first of all, the market that has really evolved the most, um, it took about seven weeks of China plateauing. So sitting somewhere around that kind of 40%, that kind of what's become known as almost like that magic number of 40% before it really started to grow properly. You had a couple of peaks along the way, uh, various different events and, and holidays that happened especially that kind of uh, peak there mid-June or heading towards uh, the tail end of June. But we really didn't start to, to grow properly until the early part of July and into mid-July. Uh, if we look at the US, the plateau was maybe not as stringent as what we've seen for China. There was more of a growth trajectory right through the whole pandemic and then it kind of plateaued more in the July, um, July and the earlier part of August. And we're seeing that kind of flat line now into August and expectation to see a small bit of growth this weekend as more people start to travel. So a longer, longer plateau period by a week of eight weeks. So that's based on the open and operating hotels. If we just skip on to the next slide, if we look at the economic occupancy, how does that view change? Well, it changes very little for China for the same reason, given that most hotels are already open. It drops a little for US, so many hotels are already open in the US but it drops reasonably significantly for North America, excuse me, for Europe. And you'll see there's, there's a pattern, uh, uh, an unplanned pattern playing out here. So it's seven weeks and eight weeks. So we've seen Europe sitting at well in excess of 10% based on uh, full inventory in many cases, 1%, 2%. Uh, we rarely show graphs of the percentage um, decimal, but on many instances for many locations around the world, we're showing half a percent occupancy and 0.7 and 0.8% especially for an economic perspective. So for the last eight weeks, we have seen growth. So what about the, if we move on, Andrew, so what about the second wave and the impact of a second wave in Europe? So if we look at that in a little bit, a little bit more detail, first of all, let me take you back to April. Things were rough. They were pretty um, rough. You'll see that 0% in Paris, that was more like about half a percent. Barcelona was pretty much shut down. This is essentially where all hotels that were going to close were closed and any properties that were open, again, based on full available um, rooms, so full economic in inventory. So any hotels really that were open in many locations around Europe were open for purpose of HSE, NHS or other medical reasons, or indeed as time evolved and went on for quarantine also. So maybe expats coming back from abroad, maybe people coming back from holidays that hadn't managed to get back um, pre things really taken hold. So roll on four and a half months and where are we now? So right up, if you look on the next slide, right up to the 20th to the 19th of, sorry, let me look at occupancy average rate first of all. So if you just kind of overlay the average rate before I move it on to the August piece. And uh, like you said, Demetrius, ground zero, um, less than half percent and really the, the best the best performer, who knew we'd be saying that those kind of uh, words, but the best performer was Moscow sitting at 8% based on a full economic um, inventory. So that was the week ending the 19th of April. Average rates were a bit of a mixed bag. Um, Zurich still held rates sitting at about 240 euros. Zurich tends to be a high performing market anyway. So they certainly learned perhaps from previous downturns, whether it was 9-11, um, whether it was global financial crisis, that really dropping rate in a market that, has not, that, that does not have demand is also not going to stimulate demand. And then, of course, with many um, properties and rooms closed. So if you move on to the next slide and look at where we're at now, August 23rd, this is the, the glimmer of hope or the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel that we have moved forward. Granted, it has taken four and a half months and still some hotels closed to move forward this far and still a reasonable amount of red on this map. So again, looking at the economic occupancy, so um, all rooms in this marketplace, St. Petersburg standing out and Russia in general is standing out. So we've um, we've seen them kind of you know, surge ahead, a lot more staycation going on. Of course, the Middle East and Dubai and Abu Dhabi would be key markets for Russians to go on holidays during June, July and August, but a lot more staycationing happening given that the borders um, going into certainly Dubai only reopened on July 7th and heavily restricted entry. Um, around the, the, 
the country or the continent it's a it's a mixed bag edinburgh seen decent occupancy for that week ending the 23rd of august but remember no fringe this year actually no festivals period the numbers in edinburgh will be sitting at in the kind of low 80s ordinarily um this for this time of year um dublin as well sitting about 30 percent uh this past weekend dublin were due to host the army navy game uh, the American football games, so we had been expecting pretty meaty, meaty occupancies and average rates, but of course that game got cancelled. Head down to the Mediterranean and it's limited demand coming in there. Certainly with um, UK now re replacing or re reintroducing, should I say, um, the quarantine in for anybody coming back from Spain, Italy is likely to go on to that. We've been hearing that back onto that quarantine list as well. Uh, and as well Portugal, so really kind of disabling those locations from being able to drive demand, given that the UK is the highest uh, demand driver for this time of year. If we move on then to look at what the implications were for average rate in RevPAR, uh, so again, a mixed bag. We've seen some really strong performance and strong average rates going into place like Athens, so whatever your Greek colleagues are doing there out there, Demetrius, they're doing something right. So a lot of the, the luxury and upper upscale hotels really, um, you know, be able to command that that nice average rate. But again, sitting at about a 17 percent occupancy for that week ending August 23rd. Um, Zurich again dropped a little bit off. We're sitting at more like 250 in the earlier parts um, of the year, certainly back in April. Um, and Paris sitting now at about 125. Paris usually sitting this time of year. Um, in the mid to high 200s. If we move on then, and um, we just have a look at what we can expect after the summer. So we're, of course, two days into autumn. So if we move on and see what um, are we looking at, first of all, when it comes to cases. So this is right up to the 23rd of um, August. And believe it or not, cases in some locations are as high now as they were at the peak back in kind of mid-April and heading towards the tail end of April, certainly for Spain, um, France and EU average is a little bit further down. The UK is nothing near the peak yet at least and you can see that kind of strong bolster in Italy um, as we see more and more cases coming into the marketplace. And this is a similar picture whether you're looking at the Middle East. So for example today in Dubai there's another 700 new cases in Dubai alone so it's um, we're not alone in Europe in seeing a resurgence of um, COVID cases. If we move on then and just look at uh, business travel, this is a business sentiment survey that was um, conducted recently. At two thirds uh, in, in Europe, two thirds of people have not returned to the office in Europe across the board returned to the office. It's the complete opposite, though, in places like the UK. So two thirds of the workforce have not returned to the office in the UK. Uh, whereas it's a more similar pattern across France, Germany, Italy, Spain. Uh, but again, one would argue that the UK is perhaps in a slightly different phase of the cycle, also by comparison to continental Europe counterparts. If we just look then at um, some of the demand in the books, demand in the books um, is a relatively new tool for us. So we collect the future demand in the books for a number of locations across these different countries. Uh, so what we're seeing here is that as of Monday of last week, there was across the UK for the next three months, there's 12% demand in the books. So that means there's 12% of rooms across the UK are committed. And that's a 2% increase on the same period the, the week before. So week on week, we're seeing about 2% lift, and that's a net increase. So of course, we'd have seen some cancellations, and we'll also have seen some new bookings. The positive part of this, excluding Spain, is that the new bookings are now outweighing the cancellations. So for a very long time, all we were seeing was negative numbers. So you were seeing little to no new bookings and cancellations far outweighing um, those new bookings coming in. If we look at that in a little bit more detail on the next slide, and you'll see then just looking out the next uh, kind of 90 days. So we're looking, sorry, next 30 days, look at the next 90 days in just a moment. So a number of key markets are across Europe, London, Amsterdam, Brussels, Zurich, Madrid, Barcelona and Paris. What we are seeing is that the lead up time, lead time is very, very short. So reasonably strong demand being picked up in Zurich. So kind of teetering on the edge of double digits, but the, the lead time is exceptionally short. A few days, maybe a week out to see that double digit um, uh, pickup coming in. So really all of the demand, with the exception of maybe one or two percent, is coming into the market in the month for the month and in many cases in the week for the week. 
If we look at that in the next slide a little bit longer out, so looking at a more of a 90 day view, this is bringing you right up to the middle of November. It really is flat beyond the next kind of three, four weeks and maybe five weeks if you're looking at somewhere like London, where we're seeing kind of two to three percent um, week on week. If you move on then and just look at um, the month by month, so looking right out to July of next year. So this time of year, we'd ordinarily be starting to see tour series start to rebook for the summer months or even for the shoulder months in April and May. So we're seeing a little bit of that, but very much in single digits um, as we head out into 2021. So still that confidence not quite there. And certainly uh, the hope is uh, all hinged on a vaccine of some description to be able to get that demand well into double digits. If we look then at the pickup, just onto the next slide, like I said, positive for the next month, but really not much thereafter. That's not to say that those numbers won't turn positive, but um, the lead time is very, very short. The lead time is in, in Europe and in all of these markets is really what we tend to see in places like Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia. So where they're traditionally a very short lead time, but we're seeing that kind of running through into Europe. I think there might be one more slide, Andrew, or maybe I left it at that. I think I left with that. OK, perfect. So over to you guys and um, back to you, back Sean. In there. Put me back in there, Andrew, please. And if you stop sharing the PowerPoint, hopefully then the other two presenters will be able to come in. OK, uh, thank you very much, Sarah, for that presentation. Um, the last little glimmer of hopes there to see that, albeit only a 2% increase in uh, bookings, at least it's heading in the right direction. And as you said, it is slight, starting to outweigh cancellations. I suppose the first question I'd have for Demetrius and for Sarah, and I know we have Eduardo and Peter uh, online as attendees, so we won't be able to see them or hear them, but they can certainly reply to questions uh, that I will ask through the chat function and I can read out their response. Uh, one of the reasons I'd invited Eduardo is an initiative that the European Travel Commission were trying to promote is this idea that we need joined up thinking across Europe. You know, we're one landmass, and the idea that countries have different restrictions and different lengths of quarantine that people might have to go through or in some cases no quarantine at all is not helping in terms of uh, travel. You know, we've all enjoyed uh, open borders for years where there was no restrictions in terms of traveling around Europe and we're now seem to be back into a scenario whereby different countries have different rules in terms of travel. So I'll open that up to both yourself, uh, Demetrius and Sarah. You know, what's your thoughts on that in terms of do you agree with Eduardo and the uh, ETC that we need to move closer to more joined up thinking in terms of travel? Uh, I, I think I, I, le I really want to go one step back and say, OK, this is the picture like Sarah has demonstrated uh, uh, about the, the whole the whole travel community. But when you are looking to detail, there are some places that they have benefited incredibly. Borgoth is probably doing one of the best years they ever had because staycation meant that in, instead of people traveling overseas, they were going to seaside resorts. Actually, quite often it was it was much uh, it was exceeding current capacity to the to the degree that the local people were having problems going to the, going to the beach because a lot of people were coming from different areas. They didn't necessarily stay in the hotels, although most of the hotels, most of my partner hotels, they are. They're really doing, they have a fantastic year and uh, and they are recovering, of course, for the months that they were closed. But but areas like the New Forest, uh, uh, Bournemouth Pool and the seaside in the UK is having a phenomenal year. And especially the, the ETA to help out um, initiative of the government made that Monday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, the restaurants were busier than Saturdays. So... First, it became the next, the, 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 what we used to know as Monday. So um, what has happened is that because of COVID, movements have happened depending on where things were, um, depending on the epidemiological kind of situation. So uh, Portugal, for example, was probably badly treated by the UK government and it was not open until late. Um, uh, while other governments are operating in a different way. Sarah talked about Greece. Greece has been very, very good at managing COVID so far. And uh, they've actually taken incredible measures uh, to protect the population and protect tourism. So when, when the UK was allowing um, 
British tourism to go to Greece. Greece was not allowing uh, British tourism to arrive yet, so it took it took a few a few days more. So what I'd like to say is that we need to be very very careful with the with the patterns and the regional uh, the regional patterns of tourism have changed dramatically this year. Uh, so going back to your points on about European policy or non-European policy, this is a political issue, and I think we've seen. Uh, very different approaches uh, to to COVID from different governments. So you've seen Sweden and um, the UK being the less cautious, if you like, and Sweden has paid that with a lot of deaths, while other, other governments were much more strict in the management of COVID. So because we're talking about uh, tourism, you have got three areas. You have got the uh, host, uh, the host country, the country that's receiving tourism. You've got the country where people are living from, and you've got the transit region in the middle. So all of those areas need to be uh, green, and to to be able to have travel activity. So politically, uh, the Senate war those um, uh, argument that that Europe needs to be united, and uh, somehow we need to operate together. Uh, but actually, epidemiologically, it doesn't work like that because even in different regions in the same place uh, had very different had very different epidemiological cases. Um, so you may have some islands that they are totally COVID free, while you had other places that they were suffering dramatically. So I think we need. It's it's more than the it's more than the political kind of the diplomatic kind of uh, argument that comes forward. What we really need to do is we really need to understand locations and how locations operate. And of course, I understand that people move from one location to another, uh, but but we really need to to understand regional development, regional geographies, and we can understand how we can uh, minimize the disruption, how we can minimize uh, the number of people who are affected by this terrible disease. Okay, put me in there again, Andrew, please. Okay, thank you for that, Demetrius. And the same question to you, Sarah, uh, putting on your STR hat and what you're seeing evidence-wise in terms of bookings. Do you think if, if we had a more unified approach to travel around Europe, it would make things a little easier for hotels and all the different elements that feed into the tourism and travel industry? Um, yeah, I think it's essential, Sean, to be honest. I mean, we see the, the difference in the numbers as different locations in Europe are either added on to or removed from um, the proverbial green list, as we've now become become accustomed to hearing it called. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of echo what Demetrius said is, you know, you have e even the reciprocal agreements, like there are so many countries that do not have reciprocal agreements, UK and Ireland being one. You know, Ireland with a requirement for a 14 day quarantine if you're coming in from the UK, whereas I can get in a plane back from Ireland or ferry or anything which I like and, uh, and have no quarantine restriction coming back into the UK. There's several different loopholes then. Um, sticking with the kind of Irish piece, you can fly at your will into Belfast and jump in a hire car and drive anywhere you like in the, in the island or indeed come in on, on a ferry from Liverpool and do the same thing from the UK, which is a massive loophole. But I think the thing that, that many people forget is it's, it's not about executing on loopholes, it's about being safe and not spreading and subsequently protect, perhaps personally contracting um, the disease that has killed so many people. I do think there needs to be much more collaboration, politics aside, across Europe. Um, you know, there's, there's a slogan that we're all in this together. We'll kind of put your money where your mouth is, is my response to this. We all need to be truthfully in this together, you know, whether it's Italy, whether it's Spain, whether it's Germany, um, at the end of the day, especially in continental Europe, it, you know, all those locations are, are intertwined and connected geographically and politically and economically and all of the rest. So, you know, definitely for the island communities, and I, I, I include in there Balearics, Canaries, you know, the, the likes of the, the real leisure destinations that, let's be honest, they've completely lost the season and many of those properties may never reopen again because they've lost this year's season. Um, something I was reading this morning, going back to Greece, is that Scotland, England and Wales, all ha all three countries have different, uh, have made different decisions around whether Greece is on the quarantine list or not now. Okay. 
Um, so that's that's a massive, 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 massive issue. It, it feels a little bit like it's every country for their own. And any of the smaller economies are are left to either follow suit or or you know not be in the game. OK, put me back in there again, Andrew, please. Uh, that's that's all very, very true. Absolutely. And it's quite interesting just what you've said there about Scotland and England and Wales. Uh, a comment from one of our attendees today saying that the United States has had the same issue across their 50 states. Each state has had different quarantine lengths of time or in some cases no quarantine at all. Um, so it's not just within Europe that that's a problem. It's a bigger issue across the pond in the United States also. Uh, a question also in here from uh, one of our attendees is in terms of resilience for both Sarah and Demetrius, if you could answer this one, is there any evidence that destinations or products who have managed to, the current situation well or slightly better than others uh, in terms of being able to recover more quickly? Um, and is there evidence of reputations being uh, left intact uh, from, from people who have managed their messaging maybe and then managed how they are operating through the COVID crisis? So if you start with Demetrius first. Yes, I, I think, um, uh, I think that um, some destinations have done extremely well. I'm very close to Greece because I'm helping a lot of people to actually operate in, under these very difficult circumstances. Uh, Crete and Rhodes uh, and Kos Islands have been very, very well managed, uh, mainly because the hoteliers understood the protocols and then a lot of other uh, and a lot of other industry uh, professionals, they kind of took uh, seriously uh, all the the different kind of hygienic uh, situation. Um, my understanding from reports I have got is that a lot of a lot of uh, travelers, they prefer to stay in bigger hotels and actually have most of their functions. Uh, and, and food and drink and everything within the bigger resort hotels. So they felt uh, more secure in those kind of situations rather than going out in different places. And, and, and I think that is something that we've seen that people were kind of, people who were very careful on what they were doing, they, they were having uh, a, a better time and, and they were managing uh, uh, the crisis in a better situation. Uh, the, the problem, has become in places where there were younger people that they had big parties and inevitably, especially when people were standing in bars or in, in dancing or they had some kind of physical activity and they were moving and they, and if you had one one case that could spread uh, much, much easier. Uh, when people went on a resort and they stayed in their allocated table and they went to the beach or they went around in different places, they were, they had a much uh, better um, uh, uh, management of, of the disease. Um, the reputation is a big thing that we are seeing now and um, that will have, uh, that will impact to 2021 and future years because people will need to understand how um, the name of their resort is actually going to be uh, seen in the future and how they can manage, uh, they, they can manage uh, the crisis. Um, I think I think those who followed the protocols and the and and what the WHO was talking about uh, did much better than, than others. Having said that, uh, in many places the statistics are not right. They don't do uh, proper statistical analysis of of the situation. And again, you have got some distortion on the stati of the statistics as well. Okay, put me back in there, Andrew, please. Thank you very much, Demetrius. And the same question for you, Sarah. Have you encountered maybe in terms of the hotel end of the spectrum, uh, companies that are slightly better at how they uh, engaged with the whole crisis initially in terms of messaging, keeping in touch with their customers, um, giving that sense of security? I mean, there seems to have been a race to the bottom initially in the tourism industry in terms of sanitation, fogging of rooms. They were basically turning hotels into glorified operating theatres probably led by uh, you know customers having very very high expectations in terms of sanitation so uh, is there any uh, anecdotes that you have from the hotel sphere of reputation management and and trading through the crisis 
Um, just kind of the first part of that question, Sean, I'd say a common theme that we've seen across pretty much the world is that, and Demetrius touched on this at the beginning, is that what we've started coining the coast and country hotels have certainly fared much better. The whole social distancing, not in the middle of a city, um, you know, less likelihood of being in a larger crowd, etc. Uh, we've certainly seen that the city hotels are the hotels that are struggling, and that's a common theme, whether you're looking at Berlin, Dublin, London, um, you know, Dubai, etc., anywhere, New York, etc., around the world. In terms of reputation, um, this might sound kind of counterintuitive, but one thing that has certainly struck me through, you touched on the sanitation side of things, when I see any property or brand kind of overemphasizing and really pushing, you know, the fumigation of rooms and everything, all that makes me think is, did you not do this before and were your rooms not super clean and the height of hygiene before? And honestly, it actually puts me off more than engages me to to want to go and stay in, in that brand or that particular um, entity if it's if it's an independent hotel because I think that's a basic um, expectation whether that expectation is always met is a whole other story but that's a basic expectation for anybody visiting a hotel is that, it is, is that that is what's being serviced to the client. Um, I do think um, the luxury hotels are, are probably doing quite well at the minute most of them are doing quite well especially the ones that are smaller especially the ones um, that are in that whole thing again about coast and country uh, the luxury, a lot of luxury hotels in big cities have either not opened yet or are due to open in the coming kind of days. Certainly quite a few of those in London um, that have either opened yesterday or today or are opening in the next three or four days time. So they've, they've kind of sat back, you know, watch, watch what happened in the marketplace and then made a decision with, at what point in time they would reopen. So it's, you know, reputation is key, but I would probably make a statement on my website if, if I were to have one as an as an operator about an assumed level of, of cleanliness and just make one statement and then leave it at that and not just kind of keep pushing that. I think one deterrent for hotels is, um, you know, when if you're going away, spa, pool, leisure centre, any of that kind of idea, that kind of relaxing weekend away, is you do have to remember that there's going to be a lot of disappointment because any hotel that's operating at more than 50% occupancy that has a lot of guests that are there for the same purpose, you, you're not going to so much as see the pool because they're going to have very, very restriction, very, very high restrictions and limited access to any of the above. So that's um, that's an opportunity that's going to be missed purely on the back of, of the social distancing and the, the high levels of hygiene in places like pools, jacuzzis, saunas, etc. OK, thank you. Put me in there again, Andrew, please. Thanks for that, uh, Sarah. Just a comment in from Peter Nash, who unfortunately can't be seen today, but he's certainly listening in and enjoying the, the conversation. He has a comment in relation to this whole idea of a unified approach. He's saying it's essential, but not easy to achieve as we face into the winter. We're all in the same storm, but not necessarily in the same boat as Irish pop star Bono says. That's his uh, his, his uh, interjection there. Um, to move on to this whole idea of, you know, travel and tourism is very much fed by large conferences, large numbers of people coming together. Uh, do either of you, either Demetrius or Sarah, ever see a time in the near future when we will be back to face-to-face, -to -face, be it academic or practitioner-led conferences? And I'm particularly conscious of the fact that TTRA runs two major conferences every year. We have an annual conference every June, which is uh, uh, more like an academic conference where our academics come to present their latest research and papers with a lot of keynote speakers. And we have our forthcoming Marketing Outlook Forum happening in a couple of weeks time on the starting of the 5th of October, which was scheduled to take place in uh, Washington in Bethesda, or Bethesda, Maryland, my apologies. And uh, some of it will be on, on in a live format, but the bulk of it is going to have to be online. We're going to have to operate a hybrid model this year. Um, so again, maybe if we start with you, Sarah, from the hotel's um, perspective, are we ever going to get back to those uh, days again of five, six, seven hundred uh, delegates attending a conference in a, the one location? Um, at the risk of sounding overly negative, not anytime soon. I don't see that happening, at least not not in 2020. Uh, it will have to happen in the future. 
you know, nobody wants to get to that balancing act between economy and, and people's lives and the whole, you know, herd immunity that Boris Johnson has talked about quite frequently. I do think there's definitely opportunity for smaller conferences and to do that whole hybrid model. Um, we're actually looking at a hybrid model ourselves for a, a, an event that we usually host in the Middle East every year at the tail end of October. Um, we would ordinarily host 300 people in a ballroom in, in Dubai. And we're looking at hosting probably something around 100, uh, assuming we get approval from the government to do so, and then having the rest um, dial in virtually from, from around the Middle East. Now, that may very well all go virtual, which is what's happened with previous events. Um, we need to be very, very careful because for those of you that are not Irish and have not heard of Golfgate, believe me, you don't want to be tied up in something like that where you have members of government heading off to, uh, to a golf dinner and deciding it's fine, even though there's a restriction of 50 people and that it's fine to to open open a divider that you have in the ballroom just to hear speeches and have 80 people. So that's certainly, I would imagine, put off a lot of people in the Irish um, economy. Um, it's not just, though, about conferences. I often think about, even within my own family, like two, you know, one, one, fa you know, one family wedding that's that was called off this year and they were coming home from Australia and all the rest to get married. Um, weddings is an inherent part of, you know, Irish economy, British economy, every economy around the world. If you can only have 20 people, some brides and grooms will be saying, thank goodness it will save them a fortune. But the vast majority will be saying, I want the 100, the 60, yeah. the 90, you know, whatever that number is. So I don't see it, Sean, this year. Um, I would sincerely hope that we'll see it next year. I think exhibitions will be one of the last last um, kind of conference led uh, events to come back though. I think conferences, okay. core conferences will come back first. OK, thank you, Andrew. Put me back in there and we'll bring in Demetrius then. Thank you for that, Sarah. And Demetrius, the same question to you, I suppose, as an academic and a keynote speaker at many events throughout the year. When do you envisage us being able to get back on airplanes and start traveling to conferences where you know, people share ideas and there's the whole value of the networking, which is very hard to do in a virtual space. I hope as soon as uh, possible, Sean. Uh, as you know, I do about 35 to 40 keynotes per year around the world. And, and the reason I do that is because I feel that we've got an obligation to kind of share knowledge with people around the world and, and to especially develop uh, help develop um, uh, developing countries with all the knowledge we've got about tourism. Uh, but we, I think we need to get perspective here. Uh, this virus has killed 8,000, 8, uh, 862,000, if I'm not right, uh, people around the world. Uh, it's probably going to kill more than 1 million. And I think, you know, as much as as I regret that I'm not going to be able to meet you in Innsbruck and Mike and many good friends, I think we need to kind of take personal responsibility and say, hold on a second, how can we reduce the amount of life that's going to be lost in this case? And I think I think everybody needs to kind of understand that it's OK, it's great to, to go to an Irish wedding or any wedding or any party and have a good time and, and celebrate with people. But but equally, if that will if that will cost the life of a couple of people, uh, then uh, because it's statistics, you know, uh, out of hundred people, there'll be uh, so many. There are probably kind of fifteen that are going to contract it. The out of this fifteen, two or three are going to end up in in hospital and one in intensive care. And you know, it's it's all statistics. So the more we can actually take responsibility and say, look, uh, we should not uh, allow big gatherings and we should make sure that we kind of protect each other and we protect uh, everything that's happening, the better it is. Now, when are we going to go back to kind of normal? I guess we need the vaccine. So when are we going to have the vaccine? Um, I don't, I'm not qualified to, to talk about vaccines, but from what I hear is that there are eight or nine vaccines that they're going to phase three. And I guess what's happening next is probably they say by the end of the year, beginning of the next year, we'll have somehow a vaccine. Having said that, the question is then, when are we going to have seven billion portions of that vaccine? And how can we get people to be vaccinated in, in this process? I guess there'll be some priority with people who are more 
uh, vulnerable and things like that. So I think we need to restrict ourselves and to restrain ourselves a little bit and to understand that, OK, we all like to travel. And I think if, if any anything that we learn out of this uh, of this period is that we really uh, would like to go and see different places to meet different people. And we kind of felt like being in prison. You know, I've never uh, I haven't traveled since March uh, and, and I've never been in a situation that, that I haven't been uh, traveling for so long. And I think everybody starts realizing how important it is uh, uh, that we travel for our mental health, for our wellness, for our ability to connect to other people. And I think one of the things that uh, that COVID is going to leave behind is that uh, it's, it's for the first time that governments uh, and prime ministers are dealing with tourism at that level. Because they realize how important it is for rural areas, how important it is for islands, how important it is for, for the peripheral regions. Because most of the peripheral regions, they live out of tourism. So um, we, we are getting into a situation that we need to be a little bit patient. And I think once, once we get to the next stage, then a lot of people are asking me, do you think that we'll ever be travel again at that kind of level? And, and of course we will. Not only that, but we'll travel more. And we'll travel more because people are really, really keen to explore, to experience, to, to get all the benefits that the that, that travel is bringing us. OK, OK, we went back there, Andrew. OK, that's good, Demetrius. And absolutely, it's, it's very important to keep uh, forward in our minds the number of people who've lost their lives due to the virus. It's very easy to get bogged down in the economies of all of this, which are also very important. But uh, behind every one of those statistics is an actual human life that uh, is no longer with us as a result of the virus. We have a question in here from uh, one of our uh, attendees uh, says, hi all, great seminar, thank you. I would be curious to ask the panel's views on the roles of social media and influencers, in particular Instagrammers, in driving tourism growth again. In Ireland, we're seeing a big push in paid stays, etc., to drive business. Just interested in the overall view of the panel. Uh, I'll put that to you first, Sarah. You're on mute there, Sarah. Sorry, thanks, Sean. Um, I fear I might be a little old for the question. I always feel like the rightly or wrongly, um, the Instagrammers of this world are a certain demographic. Um, uh, you know, kind of that sort of under 30. I guess it depends what kind of property you have. What kind of demand are you trying to generate? We've seen a lot of negative press about that demographic and, and I don't mean everybody in that age group, but uh, you know, kind of Dimitri, Demetrius Thurston is about the, you know, the kind of I, I don't care and I'm going to do it anyway and I don't I don't mind what happens and if I get it, sure I'll get it, I'll be I'll be okay. I call it the Love Island Instagram Instagrammers, you know, the guys you see kind of in the five pa five in the Pam in Dubai and there's like 700 people in the pool and it's midway through global pandemic. That's certainly not going to encourage me to go to that hotel in Dubai ever. Never mind post post pandemic for exactly all of those reasons above. Um, so it, if I was a GM in a property in Ireland or anywhere, it, it wouldn't be something I'd be paying a huge amount of attention to, at least not presently. OK, and put me in there again, Andrew. Same question to you, Demetrius. Uh, the role of Instagrammers and particularly in the term form of the staycation that is very much what is trying to save the holiday industry or tourist industry in all jurisdictions at the moment as people are now holidaying at home. But uh, is Instagrammers and social media still as relevant for staycations as it would have been for exotic destinations? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm an Instagrammer, although I'm not that young as Sarah <laughs> implied. Uh, and, and I'm, of course, a Facebooker and ev everything. Um, uh, but, but, but I think I think there is an issue about social media in general. I think, um, first of all, social media can be very good when they are moving people to the right direction. What we've seen on social media is a lot of fake news. And we've seen a lot of conversations that are really, really unhelpful. And we've seen a lot of um, uh, debates that actually are taking away uh, from the scientific dialogue that the World Health Organization and a lot of 
the responsible governments were actually having to whoever had uh, uh, 10 minutes in front of a computer and could, could raise an opinion. Uh, I think social media can be very useful when you know that the sources are trusted and um, and where, where the advice that you get is actually scientifically uh, proven. Now, uh, as far as marketing and promotion is concerned, I have been saying to people that you don't really need marketing and promotion right now. You just need to be very honest about what's happening in your facility so you can make people decide whether this for them or not. If I want, if I desperately want a party and, and, and I, I would advise everybody against it, uh, uh, then then Instagrammers and if anybody was kind of promoting parties, uh, I would I would have looked at it. And if the regulation was against that, I would have called the I would have called the authorities to actually go in there and, and stop that kind of activity. Having said that, I advised recently uh, a small Greek island that um, wanted to uh, promote tourism to people that they're really worried, you know, the smart people I, I talked earlier about the situation. And I said, look, you should, you should show uh, uh, real uh, images and real content of whether people can actually come to your island and have a good time without uh, jeopardizing their safety. So if you've got a nicely uh, laid out hotel or a, a different a diff, a, 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 a place that is that that is observing uh, the protocols and everything, you can actually show that uh, without necessarily the over promotion um, and, 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 and raising the, the message come along in, 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 in big numbers, but, but really showing what is the situation currently in that. And for me, user-generated content is effectively my eyes on everywhere because I can see what's happening in different places and I can decide for myself if it's the place to be or not. I think, I think what's also critical to understand because we're in Europe and uh, we're just in September, the temperature is going to go down and a lot of more people are going to start moving in mm. uh, because we had a lot of tourism activities because the weather was very good. I mean, in Bournemouth, we had some excellent days that were effectively Mediterranean days. I mean, the, the temperature now is about uh, uh, 18 degrees and start raining. So a lot of the activities, I can still have a meal outside. A lot of these activities in about two weeks time are going to be moving uh, uh, in-house and I think that will that will have impact as well as far as travel in the short period of time is concerned. I, I see Mike has put a question there about Innsbruck and the ski season. Uh, I'm really afraid about the ski season and, and because because um, don't forget that everything started in Italy from, from a ski resort because what happens is that people are going skiing and then of course they would like to go in and warm uh, up in, in nice places and this is by definition, you get close closer to each other. So we really need to understand geographies, markets, uh, locations, and to be able to understand how we can manage that in the best possible way. Okay, Andrew, put me back in there, please. Very good. And that brings me on to my next question for you, and maybe start with you, Dimitris, in terms of answering this. You know, the bottom end of that question from Mike in Innsbruck was, the whole idea of the industry all over the world that is for in, in some jurisdictions better than others getting supported by national governments in terms of wage subsidies etc to try to keep people in jobs through the lockdown that is not sustainable you know for years into the future until such a time as we get to a point where we have a vaccine and a critical mass of people receiving that vaccine as you alluded to yourself uh demetrius so where is our industry going to end up in terms of uh, sustaining itself without uh, numbers, obviously, you know, we have seen huge casualties in the airline industry. I think it was 12,000 people the last time I heard with British Airways that have been laid off. You now have pilots, highly skilled, trained professionals uh, that are working in uh, supermarkets, you know, delivering food to people's houses just to keep body and soul together. So the, the huge concern for everybody is that nobody has a crystal ball to say when all this is going to stop. But the casualties in terms of business from our industry are going to be enormous. You know, there will be companies that will probably cease trading 
if they haven't done so already and might never return to trading again. So I'll start with you, Demetrius. Where do you see or do you see some sort of a new world order evolving here in terms of travel and tourism where uh, it might become more expensive because there'll be less providers and therefore prices might go up? Or how is it all going to play out? Uh, I think, uh, I think the, first of all, there is a myth that only the tourism and hospitality industries and the travel industries are suffering. They are suffering more than others, but I don't see anybody buying a new car. I don't see anybody buying a new house. I don't see anybody buying new clothes. I see retailing suffering big time. I see insurance companies suffering big time. I haven't renewed my uh, AA subscription because my car is not driving. So there's a lot of uh, financial and economic issues across all the industries. And I think everybody will have very severe economic uh, disadvantages. And we will need to actually uh, bring in um, uh, uh, measures that, that they'll affect the whole economy. Um, so as far as uh, our industry is concerned, I think that what's going to happen is that short term people will People are very skilled. They are service oriented people. They are very agile. They can operate in different kind of areas. So I think in the short term, they'll move into different kind of activities like delivering, you know, food delivery, um, e, e shops, uh, a lot of the a lot of the areas that they've got much more uh, demand right now. They'll be requiring short term. Um, they'll be requiring short term uh, stuff that that hopefully will be able to 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 come and and, and help. Um, I think everybody everybody will be uh, suffering, and 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 I think that you know we don't recognize how privileged we are, especially in Europe. You know, when you start traveling some regions in Africa and some regions in Asia, you just realize that we are in a much much better situation. And let's face it. If, if, if you are looking into your cupboard, you're probably going to find 30 pairs of shoes. And I think you'll survive for one more year without buying shoes. I think we need to learn how to operate in this kind of uh, situation. And I think what we need to learn is how to operate uh, with less materialistic uh, 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 lifestyles. Uh, my main concern is that we are not going to uh, lose more human life. And I think this is really critical. And I think everybody will need to realize how we can survive without without this terrible virus killing more people until we're in a position that we're going to come back to our, our normal and we'll operate in a different way. OK, put me back in there, Andrew, please. OK, thank you for that, Demetrius. Same question to you, um, Sarah, and I suppose again with your hotel hat on you. You know, hotels absolutely cannot make money if they don't have people staying and people, you know, coming in, spending money in food and beverage and leisure activities such as the spa or whatever that they may have. Numbers have decreased. People are less likely at the moment to go and travel. They're very concerned about catching the virus. Um, when do you see something of a, a, a change in that mindset happening into the future where people will be more confident about traveling and coming and staying in hotels again? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um... I think we have seen a change in the mindset in that whole kind of coast and country piece already. Yeah. So, you know, anecdotally, my husband and I are looking for a long weekend in, in, in England uh, the last weekend in September. And it's nigh on impossible to find anything that's not in a city that's a four or five star quality that has, you know, his, his, his prerequisite is I want a pool. That's all he's asked for. That's not four or five hundred quid a night. Yeah. Um, so... I think that has I think there has been a return to travel in the areas where consumers feel most comfortable in those rural high end um, you know, locations where social distancing is, is much easier than the middle of a city. The return to travel for for the bigger cities, I think, is going to be twofold. First of all, the attractions need to reopen because let's be honest, if you look at a city like London, a lot of the reason that people go to London is for the theatres, for the museums, for the galleries, etc. So that's a demand generation that's not there as long as those various different attractions. Now, some have reopened, but as long as those various different attractions are still closed, um, the whole, you know, the, the transport infrastructure, getting there, how they get there, do they need to get the tube, the train, so on and so forth. Uh, they certainly need to kind of up their game with, with putting, you know, 
returning to, to usual sooner rather than later capacity and you know, there's been a lot of restrictions on there being less trains and less tubes because it was less people and it's a cost saving exercise. We do forecasts um, for a number of different locations around the world, but 85 different locations, roughly half of those are international, so Europe, Middle East, Africa and Asia Pacific. And in most scenarios, at the risk of sounding like we're potentially going to end in a very negative note, in most scenarios, we don't see a return to 2019 levels till 2023. So that's, okay. that's kind of what we're looking at. OK, I'll be back in there again, Michael, or Andrew, please. Uh, thank you for that, Sarah. Commenting from Peter Nash here, uh, he said his final thoughts echo those of New Zealand tourism. Now is the time to design a tour uh, tourism sector that enriches our people and our home, one that creates sustainable employment and business opportunities and one that we can all be proud of. In other words, it's time to reimagine tourism. So I suppose as a way of bringing this to a conclusion, because I'm conscious of time and we've been on for a little over an hour, uh, this is what behoves all of us, both practitioners and academics uh, who are in the hospitality and tourism business, is how do we reimagine tourism? So I will ask that one final question to put both of you on the spot. Uh, how would you imagine tourism is going to change or what will the landscape of tourism be in 2022 if that is the year that things start to return to normal? And I suppose to influence or inform your answer, you know, it's it's all well and good, as you said, Demetrius, to say people can survive with one pair of shoes instead of having 30 and you don't have to pay your A insurance because your car isn't leaving your drive. But where do all those jobs go? You know, the people who have lost employment as a result of a reduction in a demand for tourism and hospitality and travel in general. Are there enough jobs outside of the sector to to uh, absorb that that population? And if not, how do people live? How do people continue to pay their pay their bills? So over to you, Demetrius. You're on mute, Demetrius. I think it will be difficult. I've been calling for brace, brace, brace from the beginning of the pandemic. And the analogy I said is that, look, um, no airline or no no aircraft would like to, to crash. But sometimes crossing is inevitable. And we actually... We, this is a, a, a kind of crash uh, that we are experiencing and uh, and we are going to have consequences. Uh, there is no question about that. And I think I think the question is how do we manage those consequences for that period of time in the best possible way? So nobody would like to be poorer, nobody would like to lose their job, nobody would like to um, to suffer, but, but it's inevitable that we will suffer and some people will suffer uh, more and they will die as a result. I know that this is not this is not um, an optimistic kind of approach, but I think it's a pragmatic approach and we need to understand that uh, this is happening and until we get to the next stage, we need to really be, be very, very cautious as far as the uh, the health situation is concerned and then the economic uh, catastrophe that is following. We also need uh, to, to be uh, uh, to be very cautious. Um, I grew up in a in a very poor Greece um, 40 years ago. I, I guess Ireland was quite poor as well. We've yeah. we've survived poor uh, poor times, okay. And a lot of people are surviving that around the world in different kind of in different kind of situations. I, it's not it may not be pleasant, but 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 it's survival, survivable. And I think. I think the other thing you asked me, where is tourism going to go and where lives are going to go? I think I think uh, this post uh, gave the opportunity to a lot of people to actually rethink their way of life and what we're doing and what we're not doing. Um, and whether what we're doing before was the right thing or whether we should be doing in a different way. I think the future will be more meaningful ways of life. Uh, and I don't think that we're going to be less of what we're doing, but we're doing more things that are meaningful. We will have more authentic experience, we'll have less plastic experience, and we'll have more kind of, um, uh, I'll say sustainable, but not in a way, only on, on environmentally sustainable way, but sustainable uh, as a society, uh, to look into real experience and to, to look into real life and how we can um, work with society, with the people around, and how we can take away uh, the me, you know, the very individualistic kind of behavior, to more societal kind of behavior, and how we can operate together and make the world a little bit better. It, it sounds a little bit evangelical, but actually, 
I think we, we really need to start looking to how we can operate better uh, uh, together as a society and have a more meaningful life. And I think that will actually come into the travel uh, and the tourism industry in terms of what kind of experience we have, what we do, what we consume. You know, if I come to Ireland, would I consume uh, local products and potatoes and things like that? Or would I, or would I eat um, chocolate that's imported from another country? Or, you know, uh, and it's that kind of thing that I think, I think hopefully will we'll come forward out of this. Okay, put me back in there, Andrew, please. Uh, thank you for that, Demetrius. Same question to you, Sarah, and I suppose to challenge you a bit in terms of your answer. If there's a race to the coastal regions where social distancing is more readily achievable and the whole concept of nature and obviously being less possibly uh, prevalent, the virus being less prevalent in a rural setting than in an urban setting, how do we address all the major hotels that are in big cities all around the world, you know, with five, six hundred bedrooms? that are, have just seen their sales fall off a cliff. You know, when are they going to get back or are they going to get back? Are we going to see a move out of urbanized living back to more rural living like we used to have, as, as Demetrius said, 40 years ago? Yeah, I think there's there's two, twofold on that, Sean. I think, I think one is kind of going back to the point I touched on earlier is it, it's not necessarily just about the social distancing piece in big cities. It's also about what draws you to a big city. And if those attractions are, are not there yet or are not reopened yet, then that's kind of one one thing to consider, especially, you know, theatres, theatres, galleries, museums, etc., all of the above. And that, that applies to any location in the world, any kind of tourist attraction as they remain closed. That also puts more pressure on the on the urban hotels to be able to generate that demand. Um, I'm certainly a big a big supporter of what Demetrius just said around that, you know, kind of when in Ireland you you know you eat box tea and you drink pints of Guinness, uh, you know when in when in England you go for a pub lunch on a Sunday, you know when in you know the whole kind of expression when in Rome you do as I think the world has become a place where you can you can get everything everywhere, and I'm not sure that's that's the place you want to be. Like you want to go to Italy for really good pasta, you don't want to go to Italy for McDonald's, um, and that was one thing that going you know, back to the Greece piece, uh, I was in Thessaloniki for the first time about 18 months ago. And one of my favourite things about Thessaloniki is that there was only one McDonald's in the in the, in the whole island. You know that was such unique. And what what you need at McDonald's for anyway, uh, you know, in an island like um, like Thessaloniki, where you have so much so much Greek food. So I definitely think there's something around that localization piece and looking at local brands and local offerings. Um, the kind of soft brand or representation company, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. They do quite a nice a nice job of that. If you book any one of the hotels that they represent on their website. They, they put a, a local amenity in your room, whether it's a bottle of wine, whether it's a bottle of local locally made. I don't know. One of them had bubble baths, which I thought was was quite was quite kind of quirky. But I think going back to that kind of unique factor and what sets you apart, or what what makes your experience of being in Italy, Italian, being in Ireland, Irish, being the UK, British, etc., and not having that um, you know kind of global feel, no matter where you are in the world. Like I often make make the comment. Um, you know, we went to, to, to Bali a few years ago on, on honeymoon, of course, cliche as that sounds. And the first part was up in up in the in the forest and it was very evident you were in Bali, you were in Indonesia, there was no chance you could be anywhere else in the world. It was so such a local feel. The second part was down the beach and candidly you could have been anywhere from Majorca to Dubai to Malaysia. It was just another nice five star hotel with a swim up bar. So it, it was lovely, but it we could have gone and done that in in Mallorca or in Tenerife or in anywhere else that was a couple of hours flight. So I think that that being 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 unique and offering the uniqueness of the destination is certainly something that I think should be explored quite extensively. Okay, put me back in there, Andrew. Now we'll finish up. Okay, so just to bring all this to a close, uh, I think paraphrasing what Demetrius and Sarah are saying there towards the end is this whole idea of authenticity, which is quite uh, written quite extensively about in the literature of travel and tourism. Um, and I think it's that move to wanting more authentic experiences, which in, in, in the main you actually can charge a lot more for. You can char pre charge a premium price for something that is authentic and is a genuine experience of that destination, which speaks to what you were saying there, Sarah, about being up the mountains and it was absolutely Bali. You couldn't imagine you were anywhere else. Whereas as you moved into your hotel, they're, they're sanitized, I suppose is the word I would use 
uh, forms of experience. So I think if anything, my own perspective, offering my own opinion in terms of where tourism is going to be, I think absolutely we need to move back to more authentic experiences that are genuine to the region, that are in character with the region, the whole provenance of the food that's served in that area, that it is farm to fork, it's coming locally. And I do think people will pay a price for that. Um, but the mass tourism model, I think it's possibly run its day. I don't know if we'll ever get back to the hedonistic days of thousands and thousands of flights every day from different destinations around the world uh, and, and, and uh, having that sort of mass tourism experience. So just before I finish up, I want to thank very, very deeply our two panelists, um, Demetrius and Sarah, and also Eduardo <clears throat> and Peter Nash, who unfortunately couldn't join us for, uh, online, but they have been listening in the background and uh, posting some comments themselves. Uh, TTRA, Travel Tourism Research Association, is an association that was started back in the 70s in the United States. We're very much focused on bringing practitioners like Sarah with academics like Demetrius. So it's that marriage between bringing the, the stats and the statistics that the practitioners uh, are, are in demand for and very much need to make smart business decisions with the research and the outputs that are coming out of universities all around the world. In today, on, online today, we have over 240 people that registered for this webinar today and it was quite interesting to see the geographical spread it literally ranges from guam in the pacific and new zealand to the united states all across europe um, and a lot of people that are both in the academic sphere as well as people that are practitioners and operating within the industry i think what's unique to our industry is as demetrius said we are people who think outside the box we're very creative we're very adaptable that's why we're highly sought after outside of tourism and hospitality um, by other industries because of our ability to problem solve and do so on our feet. And we have survived many crises in the past, be it world wars through to terrorism attacks, etc. The unique characteristic of the current crisis, unfortunately, is it's a pandemic. It is literally in touching every corner of the globe. But my own personal view is I'm hoping out of the seven billion that are on the planet, there'll be a couple of smart individual scientists I'm talking about here that will come up with a vaccine in the short term rather than the long term. And yes, it is down to getting traction with that vaccine then and getting as many people to adopt it and take it as possible. And then we will get back to being traveling again, but we have to travel smarter. Um, just to give a plug, we have two um, events coming up. So the first one is within my own chapter. So we are the European chapter of, of TTRA and we have our annual conference happening in Innsbruck in Austria. It's a blended or a hybrid model for that conference. So we will have some delegates based in Austria attending in person and then the, the, the event will also be offered in a virtual uh, model online for people like myself who would love to be in Innsbruck, I can assure you, on the 28th of September, but unfortunately I can't be, but uh, I will be joining it online. So we have some great keynote speakers, including Demetrius, who will be uh, presenting at that event. And if you want to hear him, absolutely log on to, w to TTRA, uh, go in www.ttra.com and you'll be able to see all the various events that are uh, coming up within TTRA in the next couple of months and be able to register for them. And the second one I want to push is our Marketing Outlook Forum. And uh, just a correction, this is actually a virtual conference. There's no on-site uh, offering for this this year, unfortunately, due to the crisis. But it's an unprecedented opportunity to hear from top industry leaders and best travel companies and travel research. It will help you through guiding intelligence and insights into making decisions for the year ahead. And it is a go-to, a must go-to uh, space in our industry every year. Those conferences in the past have been very highly sought after and very well attended. Um, because people want the latest and best information from the best minds in our industry. So I highly recommend that you would log on and register for Marketing Outlook Forum as well, which is starting on the, I think it is the 5th of October. So without further ado, just to bring the whole session to a close, it's been a fantastic um, hour or so with all of our I mute myself. Great to see the questions coming in as well from people who've been attending. And for those of you that couldn't link in with us online, uh, you will be getting a link to the recording of this session that you can play back at your own uh, convenience. Because obviously with the geographic spread of all of our attendees, um, it was highly un unlikely that all 240 would log in at the same time to listen to us. Interesting and all as both Demetrius and Sarah are. 
So just to finish up with myself, I forgot to introduce me. Um, I'm a lecturer here in Shannon College of Hotel Management. We're a small little hotel school in the west of Ireland that was started well over 60, nearly 70 years ago at this stage by somebody who I think we absolutely need in our future in travel and tourism. It was a guy called Brendan O'Regan who was ahead of his time in terms of the initiatives that he brought to bear in Ireland at a time of economic strife where unemployment was very, very high and there was very little opportunities for people in terms of employment. So this ban started the first duty free in the world, which is actually here in Shannon uh, Airport. Uh, he started the first mail order uh, company way before eBay, Amazon or anybody else ever came up with the idea uh, you could buy duty free products from Shannon Airport online through catalogues back old school. My favorite time of life when you actually dialed the phone and got a voice at the end of it rather than an automated recording. Uh, pre laptops, pre technology, it was all done using phones and using catalogues that were mailed out. Uh, he started banquets in a local castle here, so lots of wonderful initiatives, including the college that I am proud to be a staff member of here. So uh, we have lots of graduates all over the world that have worked in some of the best hotels and uh, tourism and hospitality um, enterprises around the globe, leaders in their fields. And what's great to finish on a positive is we are very optimistic for our industry. Uh, we interview our students that come into us every single year and there's been extreme interest and consistent interest from the uh, students that are applying to come into Shannon College uh, in, in September and that did not fall off as a result of the crisis, which is very affirming to see that they, they understand that this is a temporary bump in the road, but that travel and tourism will absolutely rebound and come back, uh, possibly in a different format, absolutely, but it will return uh, in the near future and it will continue to supply uh, quality employment and very different types of employment to other areas of industry that are out there. So thank you very much to Sarah and Demetrius. Thank you to Andrew Langford, a colleague of mine who has been working very, very hard in the background here, making sure all this technology works for me because where I'm good at some things, one thing I am not good at is technology and all my colleagues here in Shannon can attest to that and most of my students, much to my, uh, my uh, hilarity as well. So thank you very much everybody and uh, stay safe and stay positive. And hopefully at some time in the near future, we will all get to meet up again uh, in the flesh rather than looking at each other through webcams and uh, computer screens. So thank you very much and take care. Bye bye. Thank you, gentlemen.